Welcome, world. This is Ilona Budapesti, president of Oxford Entrepreneurs and chief storyteller at One Million Women to Tech. We have brought you an amazing Fundamentals of Business Planning workshop here from University of Oxford. Our speaker, Sarah Shahid, will tell you more about herself and I will turn on the slide so that you can follow along. Grab something to take notes on. So if you're a paper and pen person, grab those. If you are a computer person, then make sure you have two screens up so that you can follow along. We would love to get your feedback. This is an experiment. Uh, it's really the first time that we're trying to share from Oxford to the world. So please uh, tell us your feedback. And also, if you're an experienced broadcaster, we always need uh, helpers and advisors. So please um, put a comment in on how we can get in touch with you. All right, thank you. Sarah. Yeah. Can we have a round of applause? Please introduce yourself briefly. And Hello, everyone. So I'll be looking at both the cameras at the same time. So I'm looking here and at the audience. So here and there. Um, I'm Sarah Shahid. Uh, I'm uh, basically working in a tele. I've been working for the telecom sector for the last 13 year. Uh, 13 years telecom and uh, technology based uh, experience. I've got gathered over the 13 years that I've worked. Sure, yeah. So I guess I'll start again, given this is my first time on a podcast as well. So uh, bear with me for the first 10 minutes before I get into the flow. That said, uh, so today I'll be giving you an introduction into business planning and how it's done. The reason I'm doing this, just to give you a comfort of uh, whether what I say is worth listening to or not, is just to give you a context on what all I've done in the past. Uh, as I mentioned, having worked in the telecom sector and the technology um, sector, it gives you a lot of exposure uh, when it comes to various products, various industries, because any business needs to get to the customers. And these days, uh, the telecommunication sector or uh, the mobile phone is one of the most lucrative ways of going about it. It's low cost. Uh, it has a very high outreach. And secondly, it introduces you to a lot of technologies that otherwise you might not uh, be privy to when you start your own business. Uh, so I've uh, had the privilege to work on various projects, which include technology-based projects when it comes to WiMAX, when it comes to um, internet-based connectivity, whether uh, be it through your phones, your dongles, uh, voice connectivity through your phones. Um, and uh, it, just recently, over the last couple of years, the telecom industry in general has moved towards a more content-based approach as well. Uh, what they feel is that you can't just be a dumb pipe for too long. So they're, they're making a conscious effort to um, increase the overall exposure that the digital sector has to the audiences and amalgamate and uh, partner with them to bring more opportunities to uh, people globally. So that gave me an opportunity to work with uh, different startups. Um, I've been actively involved in evaluating various business cases when it comes to um, incubators and uh, new business opportunities. Secondly, even within the company, um, I've managed a significant portfolio. So for example, if you look at a Spectrum auction, it can go up to somewhere around uh, $395 million just to start with when it comes to a base price in the developing sector. Uh, so moving on, let's make this about to you people how I can actually add value and uh, teach you how to go about it, make effective pitches, and what's critical when it comes to business planning. Having presented various business cases, not only uh, to senior management, but also having heard a lot of business cases come in from startups, from digital businesses, from technology businesses, and also having heard and experienced uh, a dialogue that you have with top consultants in the world. Uh, the company that I work for, it's a Telenor, uh, it's a Norwegian company called Telenor. They have operations all across the globe. So naturally, they tend to hire a lot of consultants and very recognized consultants, which include McKinsey, um, A.T. Kearney, Deloitte, uh, to actually not only validate the assumptions that we have internally about our business, but to uh, prepare pitches and uh, prepare business cases, which are not only validated internally, but also are good to show to the shareholders, right? We need to build trust in the longer run. Having said that, how can that now before you go into it can yes. i can i say how we met and why of course of yeah. course please paul our chairman wanted to say something please i do a lot of video production yes um, because you're speaking too fast you sound very nervous so you need to slow down a little bit because you're speaking at very very high speed which people on the net may not be able, be able to, to follow 
I agree. We have some viewers already online. Um, so wonderful. The way we met was, uh, I hope it's okay. I know in Pakistan, sometimes it's questionable, but here in the West, I think many people are really touched by social missions. And we were at a talk where Malala was there. And I mentioned the Women's Summer of Code to them that you viewers are probably part of. And after the talk, uh, because in the question I, I asked how we can reach out to Pakistan from Malala, and she gave us very good advice. She said we can easily reach universities because the infrastructure is good. But if we want to go into the rural areas and the villages, we will have to work directly with the educational activists there. And then Sarah comes up to me and says, I work for Telenor and we have 44 million subscribers. Uh, right? Something like that. I, I forgot the details, but the, I remember it was a very large number. And our mission is to reach 1 million women by 2020. So when she came up to me, I thought, oh my God, this is a serious business person. And then we sat down and she ripped apart very nicely, but very, very systematically ripped apart our, uh, our plan. And then I thought, because the volunteers at Oxford Entrepreneurs have been asking for training, I thought, would you, Sarah, please come and tell us from a serious business perspective, how does one go about presenting a business case to some large business, for example, Telenor, but really anybody else who has millions and millions of users. So my hope is that everybody here, uh, as a volunteer especially, can benefit from this kind of strategic thinking. And of course, if you're running your own business, then it's very, very valuable as well. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Lola. That was very helpful. Um, so basically, I need to slow down now. <laughs> I've been talking very fast. I generally talk fast. So whenever you feel that uh, I've uh, paced up, let me know. I'll slow down again. Uh, I will now share the presentation. Sorry, if we can't get because of this. I think that's how it would be. Not presenting as well. It's presenting now. Yeah. Um, where? Here? Yeah. If we do, if you do that, then you guys won't see it because here it goes into presentation mode. And you don't see it. Swap, this, swap displays. But if I swap the display, so maybe we could connect uh, this to another laptop altogether. Just use that. Yeah, if I could, but there's no mouse. Okay. I think we'll stay. What we can do is do it this way. Would this work? And then we can go right back. Sure. OK, so we'll start off. Uh, fundamentals of business planning. Uh, today, I think the one thing uh, that I feel has been critically missing when it comes to pitching new businesses and actually having a discussion with investors, that we lose the essence of why we're there. Uh, we forget uh, when we begin a discussion as to what kind of an individual we're actually talking to a person and not to a bank account. Because generally, whenever I've uh, noticed people pitching their business ideas or actually asking for funds, it's just like you're very passionate about what you want to do. You want the money to do it. And you just expect the person sitting in front of you to buy your idea and just hand that money over to you. If somehow we recognize the effort that goes into that person's um, life in earning that amount that he did, which he's now putting forward as an investment to you, it just makes the dialogue that much more effective. No one spends someone else's money as carefully as he spends his own. Um, 
needless to say nobody disagreed with ever whether it's your money somebody else's money if you're investing if you're making an investment giving out a loan you'll be as conscious about the investment as any next person so why do investors invest at all if they're that uh, possessive about their money or uh, they're that risk averse or you know if they are willing to take the risk how much of a risk are they willing to take there's always that 1% that you don't want to risk right everybody wants higher returns that said if you look at uh, research facts 74% of new ventures have been funded either by uh, immediate family or friends when it comes to startups that's a surprising fact but not for me at least because when i've sat through a lot of discussions and a lot of investor pitches what i've realized is that there are key fundamental human factors that are just missing in that whole discussion which if we somehow bridge the gap to we'll be able to have a much more lucrative and a more concrete uh, result uh, as opposed to a disconnect where the startups always feel that they are not heard the investors always feel that their uh, questions are not well answered so why this gap so why do investors uh, invest with family and friends to begin with there's an unsaid element of trust you've known that person all your life if not all your life for a couple of years right at least you have built that repo with that person uh, there's a relationship that has been built on mutual respect not only for that individual but also the experience that he brings to the table whoever you go to contact or have a discussion with when it comes to a new business idea you have to, you inherently respect something about the experience that they've gained over the years which adds value to your portfolio so they also recognize that fact and your body language makes a lot of difference when you're having that conversation uh they're perceived to be like minded people uh you're actually working you assume so it's it's human nature if i've worked with elona for a while and if we've clicked on a certain uh, level of conversation or a certain uh, wavelength i would naturally believe that whatever project that i would do with her uh, we will be on the same page they're open to criticism and they're willing to have honest dialogue i think this is one of the most critical factors when it comes to pitching a new business if you go to family and friends uh, you are much more comfortable in actually asking questions which otherwise you are wary of asking because the other person becomes very defensive and that has been true for a lot of pitches that i've attended people and especially startups become so passionate about their ideas that they, that they start fo focusing on a part of business which is more relevant to them without realizing that it might not be as relevant to the investor uh, assume to be able to take feedback and realign objectives accordingly so when you're working with a friend or it is much easier to have a more critical dialogue and that gives the other person or the investor the comfort that if i have an opinion around the kind of business that they're doing we'll be in a much better position to align and my business is in much safer hands as opposed to uh it being addressed uh if i go and invest it with a complete stranger then there's a mutual recognition of the effort that went into earning that investment pool so as i said body language says a lot you going to a bank asking for a loan and you going to your father asking for a loan are two very different conversations that you end up having you have a certain level of respect for your family member or your friend because you've seen the struggle that they've gone through to earn that money but if you go ask that money to a bank or anybody else for you it's just an institution you're like i have a very solid business case look at my side of the story your side not that relevant just give me the funds so if at the beginning you're a able to somehow crack that code break these barriers i think you're off to a very good start to begin with so having talked about the investor side of the picture then there's the startup side of the picture we can never discount the passion that a new entrepreneur has we can never discount the passion that a person wanting to start a business has so where does a business idea come from you feel you have the skills to create a unique product or a service yourself uh you want to design something you want to come up with uh, you've come up with an idea you think there's unmet demand in the market that you can somehow meet by uh, a business idea or there was a problem in the market or a need in the market that you could address uh, or you have the skills or you feel you have the skills to connect a certain unmet demand with an oversupply in another part of the world globalization that's what's triggered a lot of businesses in the last couple of years uh, you might feel that there's uh, a product being produced for a much lower price in china or thailand that 
could be sold in UK for a much higher price and you being an intermediary could make money out of it. A great business case. But the bottom line is you have a great idea and you think that it will work. But what makes you believe that the other person feels the same way? What can you do to bring them on the same page is what is critical when it comes to pitching your business. And these words don't help your case. The reason I say this is because the data industry or basically the digital industry or the internet, I feel instead of supporting the entrepreneurs is or the startups is exaggerating and making them way too passionate than they already are, making them sound way too passionate than they already are. And I'll elaborate that more. So this is one of the clippings that I came up with just randomly searching on the internet. Entrepreneurs are not compliant. So you're asking somebody for money, their hard earned income, and, you're st and they're made to believe that you're not compliant. If they expect a certain return, they want a certain, return, um, uh, certain payback. If you feel that's not the kind of return you want to give them, you might not want to even do it, right? Uh, you have no fear of failures. You never give up. Uh, entrepreneurs tend to take risk, leap into uncertainties, and uh, they are relentless and persistent. Now, when it comes to investing money, especially, uh, especially these variable, or these adjectives, or you know, these explanations around how a startup or a uh, or an entrepreneur actually is an, as an individual just tends to create a disconnect or a lack of trust between a person who wants to be more sure of where he or she is investing and what kind of return they're looking at. So compare these two situations. On one side, human psychology says that no one spends someone else's money as carefully as he spends his own. And on the other side, a startup is being pitched to be led by an individual who's so passionate that they will do whatever it takes to make their business work, even if it feels sunk cost. You know, initially putting in money, a lot of uh, advertisement or a lot of subscriber acquisition cost, or trying your best to make it work. These disconnects are to be taken and handled very carefully when you make your business pitch. If somehow you can break these barriers, if you can kill these perceptions from day one, uh, or basically, as they say, an investor only spends, so research says that a good investor spends around three and a half minutes to make a decision whether he wants to invest in a new business idea or not. Given that, perceived to be the, the perception of a very thin line between passion and obsession should not exist. You should only come forward as somebody who's passionate about what they want to do. There's again a very thin line between emotions and practicality. You might be very emotional about the idea, you've worked on it, you feel that you want to change the world, you've thought of a startup or a business idea which can actually give education across the globe, as we and Alona were discussing. But how practical is it to go ahead with that mission? How, uh, whether it makes sense to have that big an ambition initially or not? Have you even tested your product or not? How can you give somebody that, uh, that comfort that you will not be impractical when it comes to investing their money? Then another concept uh, that is generally seen when you look at new business startups is uh, the independence that they're seeking. So when you talk about new businesses, whenever I think of starting one, uh, the one thing that attracts me the most and the one thing that I really crave for at times having uh, worked for a nine to six job in a corporate uh, environment for a while now is the independence. I'll be able to make my own decisions. I'll be able to make my own calls. I will not be answerable to somebody else, right? I'll be, make, be able to make the decisions on the go. But at the same time, if you look at it from an investor's perspective, that could be perceived as me being rigid. So if I have my own ideas, if I have my own beliefs, what more can I do to not come about as somebody who's rigid and who will not take good ideas when they come on the table? This is where the business plan comes in place. So you have an investor who's ready to give you money, but at the same time, think of him as or her as an individual who needs to understand where you're coming from, who needs to be able to trust you. So a business plan should be able to do these certain things whenever you're making a pitch or um, addressing any investor. It should be able to build trust. It should be able to create common understanding, show flexibility, uh, increase belie believability in your business idea, and demonstrate respect.
because we have we have seven in the academy here. So we will later show examples of all of these student value examples today. Or is it possible to do that? Because I think that's what would give a lot of value to everyone. So um we just got a question from uh, the audience where Elona is asking if uh, I'll be going into more detail when it comes to uh, specifics on the business case. So today what I'll be covering is the variables that you could actually address to make a business case. So for example, if I talk about build trust, creating common understanding, what should your what level of detail should your business case entail? Secondly, I'm bridging the gap between a conceptual business case and the numbers and the financial bridging over there. So a lot of times when you talk about customers, it's just easier to say that I want to target all women, right? But how many women? How, what are the variables that are going to make you contextualize and quantify your market? So um, does that answer the question? OK. So what is a business plan? What we've read in business schools and is also used very um, regularly is a business canvas, business model canvas, right? I think most of you would have seen this already. Uh, this basically addresses the whole life cycle of a business. And as part of the investor pitch, uh, this is one of the key documents that any startup tends to fill in when they want to present what they're doing as a business concept. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here because I'm going to move to the finance bit of it, the Excel based bit of, bit of it, assuming that you all know exactly how this pans out. Um, needless to say, you should have a very good idea of each and every section of this canvas when you are about to go make a pitch for your business or ask for any funding anywhere, uh, irrespective whether it's a venture capitalist, it's a big organization, or it's just somebody in your friends and family circle. You need to know who your key partners will be. Um, actually, the way I would address this is I would, first of all, identify the value proposition. So I would begin this from the center. So when you have a value proposition, you need to understand what are the key activities for you to be able to deliver on the, on the value proposition. So inside out on the business uh, canvas, as opposed to taking a left to right approach. People fill it in left to right, but from experience I've realized inside out makes more sense, center outwards, right? If you don't have a good value proposition, your key activities, partners, customer relationships, custom segments all become irrelevant. Um, have just it. have a show of hands who, who, who has seen a business model canvas? Who has done one first? Okay, who has done more than one? Okay, so uh, we have a fairly mixed audience who've actually at least seen it. And once you do it, it's not very difficult to fill. It's pretty easy. You just have to be very concrete in what you put in. Should not be a lot of fluff, a lot of stories. Make it believable and make it crisp. But what people tend to miss out when they make pitches is that when it comes to investors, numbers speak louder than words. On one hand, you're asking for money. On the other hand, you're giving stories. So not discounting the business concept in any way, but you need to bridge the gap, right? If somebody is giving you money, you have to respond in a monetary term as well. Give them the comfort that that money will come back. So in my, from um, maybe I have spent too much time making Excel models, but uh, I tend to realize that, uh, I've realized that they are very important. They're very critical. Uh, they're much closer to me compared to all other roles that I've done. And I think they tend to create more value and uh, more believability in what I say and do compared to any other models that I've used generally. So financial Excel model, in, in my opinion, is a dialect that can subtly yet effectively create believability around a business concept. Oh, can I be devil's advocate? Please do I that. I spend a lot of time not just Excel spreadsheets, but then actually doing pricing models and probability models and so on. Um, <laughs> how often do your, what's, what's your variation between making the model and then, I don't know, like the one year reality in your experience, how, how close or far away are they from each other? So I've addressed that as well. Uh, over the, it comes from experience if I tell you. Okay, so I'm just repeating the question. Uh, the question was that how close are the business models and the forecasts that are made to reality and how we can ensure that they're close to reality, right? If I sum up the question. 
or whether they are or not. Yeah. Uh, so go back 13 years, I wouldn't even believe in them. People used to, I used to come up with business plans that used to be maybe 50% completely off from what the forecasts were. But the more you make them, and what I've realized is that the more variables you introduce to a business model, the closer you get to the actual projections and the forecasts. And that, once we go through the structure, will also get highlighted. That, as you said, if I just assume a high level number and move on in a business model, that is bound to be be way off than what is actually going to happen. But if you introduce more variables that take you to the granular uh, proposition that you have in your business uh, concept, the margin of error will effectively go down to plus minus five to 10%. And that's how close you come after a decade in the sector. Uh, so financial models. And by the way, uh, as part of my annual reviews and targets, uh, for the longest time, I would have a target which was that my forecast could not go plus minus 5% overhead. Otherwise, my year-end bonus was not happening. So, you know, that's, and uh, I have my spouse sitting here as well. We come from the same sector. We've both been through the same. So we go through rigorous trainings. And when I sit here today and tell you that it is possible, trust me, it's possible. But it comes with experience. And also, I think this is for an established, uh, established business Yes, not also new businesses. So it's how new businesses feed off established businesses to make themselves stand correct. So what happens is that generally when we look at our own businesses, we take a very standalone approach. We only look at variables which are more internalized and we don't feed off what is actually working. And that's the interplay that helps you bridge the gap of uh, the five to 10% versus the 50% that you could uh, stray away from. So the financial models, a typical financial model, of course you have revenues and you have costs and then you're talking about margins, right? I think a business plan is much more than that. An Excel file should not just have your revenues in it where you're multiplying your customers by the revenue per month that they're giving you and, and coming up with a figure, putting in costs and that's about it. I think that's just a blank Excel sheet that will not help anybody. A business plan, in my opinion, can cover a lot more. It can start off from the ecosystem. It can talk about market dynamics. It can actually introduce competitor outlook, uh, market sizing, pricing and promotion, uh, the business operations themselves, and financial returns. Now, people often ask me, how do you build in an ecosystem into an Excel file? You know, how do you do that? How do you build market dynamics into an Excel file? You can build them up any way you want. This is your business, own it. There is no right way of doing it. Uh, one thing I feel is very unfortunate in today's world that there are a lot of companies who've set up, who've been set up, and they claim to have raised X amounts of funding over the years, right? Yes, they must have cracked a code for those businesses, but just because it doesn't work for you doesn't mean you have a bad, bad business idea. I believe you just have to own your variables know your business well and this is your journey literally this is your journey it's how believable you make it and how close you are to reality and how realistic you are in um, accepting the positives and the negatives that you're able to define the business case and there is no template for it in my personal opinion this i believe by uh, just because my path is different doesn't mean i'm lost it's how you communicate it, right? By the end of the day, uh, it comes down to how you stand confident in front of the investor, in front of the, uh, the venture capitalist, and make them believe that what you're saying is worthwhile listening to. And that can be done in a million ways. So I talk about the business ecosystem. Identify factors and variables which are critical for the existence of your product outside your own business model. I'll give you a very simplistic example here. Uh, if tomorrow I want to go to a country and uh, so variables, yeah, I'll be very basic here. I've moved to Oxford. I love cooking. Let's assume that. And I want to start up a restaurant. And I've seen a lot of students go to these um, trucks, food trucks, right? They're very popular here because after seven o'clock, you don't get food anywhere. So clearly, this seems like an opportunity because most of the food trucks are only selling chicken and chips or they're selling burgers, or they're selling wraps. 
why isn't there more variety on the roads so for a person who's just come from another country it could be very easy i could just introduce my own cuisine over here why am i not doing it the fact of the matter is that from a top down level huge opportunity many students a lot of them want variety i could just say please give me money to start a food truck because i make good food now this is somebody's money i'm asking for i have no facts and figures on ground and i just expect them to give it to me because i think my food tastes great do we all like food from all countries across the globe of course not we all have our own personal taste palette and that could be true for the investor as well uh what are the commonalities between the food that i bring to the table and the food that people over here will like from an investor's perspective it could be common ingredients maybe we're both using the same ingredients if i talk about the ingredients the investor is much more likely to uh assess the commonalities that can come out of it so for example if what i make is very spicy he could just say well you're using the same ingredients bring down the spice level we might be good to go very simple basic things so identify factors and variables when i say identify factors and variables work on the fact that people in uk generally don't have spices right uh so that's outside your business model that's outside your business case it has got absolutely nothing with the way you cook it's got absolutely got nothing to do with the ingredients that you use it's a factor outside your business case evaluate policy and regulatory environment in which your business will operate if you're not even allowed uh, to put up more food trucks what's the point of even evaluating this business case so you know why pitch something if you haven't done the check what if the oxford council only permitted four people to be sitting there in the first place and you can't be the fifth one and this uh there's a question so uh, the problem is that maybe there are lots of these things that we do not know from, from the start maybe i mean knowing that people in the uk doesn't like spiciness that would apply it's not very clear but uh, there might be some other examples that we can catch up with that because how do you discover them okay um very good question the question is that uh, how do you discover the subtleties uh that will actually work for you as opposed to the ones that you feel will not work for you you do it by introducing a minimum viable product mvp um i'm not sure if people are familiar with that uh, word it's basically setting up doing a test trial as per se it's much easier to do it for things like food but when it comes to technological gadgets it, it slightly becomes more complicated but if you search a uh, big tech companies tend to use very basic elements to just stress test the model and get initial customer feedback and i think that work can work wonders for any business that you go ahead with uh so that's one of the way of uh, going about it okay so moving on identify variables that impact your product to predict foreseeable changes in the future and naturally create more room for innovation so what we do is we only think about the present and that is the most ineffective way of way of forecasting or making a business plan we never look at the market structure we forget to look at the technological evolution there is a possibility and the fact of the matter is that people do go out of business only because they miss out on what's happening in the market and you can avoid doing that by just riding the wave accepting the changes that can potentially come and pivoting yourself or realigning your business to go with the flow and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that uh and then generally country dy dynamics if tomorrow uk decides to not give out more visas we're out of here right at least i'm out of here uh i'm still on a visa that to a spouse visa so it doesn't help my case so if i'm setting up a business i will be very careful of uh, these environmental hazards that could hit my business if i plan to stay here long term that said uh what kind of market structure changes that we can look at for example if i plan a business for june right the summers a lot of people tend to come in you have a lot of um, tourists visiting and i see my forecast things i've done a pot product trial i've uh, gotten great reviews when it came to tasting and uh, what i've forgotten is that in december nobody stays in oxford people either go on christmas breaks they go to travel they're on leave they're not here then what does my card go out of business 
So these factors, which include seasonality, which include uh, general customer demand. Uh, by seasonality, I mean weather could be a factor, events could be a factor, uh, general dynamics in the government could be a factor. For example, if there are uh, elections coming up or there's some other sort of festivities coming up, you could see spikes or you could also see downfalls in your uh, business cases. But if you acknowledge them and build these variables in from day one, that helps build trust. So if I tell my investor on day one that in the next three months, I might be able to make give you 100% growth. But I'm also accepting the fact that in December, this growth is going to go down to 50%. So the average will be somewhere around 70 to 75%, but I'm accepting it. So it does not come out as a surprise. So accepting shortfalls is critical and accepting the downturns in your business upfront is critical to ensure that people believe what you're saying. For specialized products, targeting a niche segment with minimal ability to relocate. So generally, there are products which are only good for a certain segment of the society, right? As I said, extremely spicy food might just be good for 10% of students studying in Oxford, right? But if I consciously still want to address that 10%, then I need to be wary of the fact that the I'm carrying high risk. The likelihood of me going out of business compared to somebody who's addressing 50% of the market is much greater. I need to talk about that upfront. If I establish those risks and the investor knows that she knows what she's talking about, she's when she's taking a risk, there's an exit plan. And the reason I talk about exit plans very candidly upfront is, uh, even in business cases that we pitch, what can potentially go wrong? Because if you talk about what can potentially go wrong, not only are you forcing yourself to think about alternatives if and when that happens, you should have an exit strategy in mind as well. Because there's only so much money you should lose in a business. A good entrepreneur should be able to pivot. He or she should be able to realign or reuse their resources elsewhere to recover losses as soon as they come or start happening. There are business which will give you a loss in the first two or three months, but you know for a fact that they'll pick up in the coming months. But there are also businesses that might not uh, show you losses for the first two, three months, but as soon as they hit rock bottom, you should know when to come out. So for example, if um, I'm selling ice cream, and there's an epidemic which or there's a viral infection that is triggered by ice cream and the government is running a whole campaign telling people not to have ice cream ever again who am i fooling how long will i be able to sustain an ice cream shop if people are on a daily level being informed that you should not be eating ice cream you know there's only so much that i can do in this country anymore right go sell somewhere else relocate, go to an area where this is not an issue, where the viral does not exist. But be true to yourself and be true to the business that you're doing. Can I say something? Of course. In, in this world that you described, the, the financial projection and execution is extremely well aligned. Because what you're saying is if you see the numbers and you make business decisions and based on the business decisions and your discovery, you actually add your, your variables. But I mean, um, maybe startups have a new experience. And more uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not always the case that the financially. I, what, what, what I'm seeing is it's often the case that the person who's hired in to do the financials is an outsider, an accountant, or a financier who really doesn't care about how you execute. Is really, it's just not involved in the business, and therefore you lose all this excellent intelligence, and it becomes more of just an exercise. Do you have this? Do you see this in? Experience? Yes. It happens. It happens. Uh, so the question is right now that uh, uh, an investor who is more of an accountant and a finance person is not as emotionally attached to the business as you are, plus not that interested in the variables that will be more relevant to you um, and to your business. And the execution. And the execution. Exactly. So that's, this is exactly, you basically hit, um, yeah. hit the nail. Exactly. Uh, Study potential models, and the next point was going to address this. Study potential models to assess product viability. This is how you create that believability and bridge the gap between execution and the disconnect that the investor has from the product. 
whenever you go to any pitches, uh, this is what this is a classic issue there, right? An investor is coming there. He's just looking at an Excel model that you're presenting. Does not understand the time and effort that went into making that product, the variables that worked really well for the product, and some of the variables that are not working could actually be reassessed, right? You could find a solution for them. You might not have them today, but you might have a solution after two to three months. So, who gives you that time and that breathing space to actually assess, uh, realign, pivot, and adjust yourself accordingly? So I think, in all fairness, startups need breathing time. Yes, you give them the money, but don't expect returns the next day. And in order to create that connection with the product and the process, I think the minimum viable product approach is the best. No matter what you sell, what service you, so a startup basically is anybody coming up with a with an idea where they can actually come up with a product or service which they can sell to a customer. Think of your investor as a customer. If you can't sell your product to your customer, then why are you making the product in the first place, right? There are products which are not that easy to set up. Uh, it could be a complete app that you're developing, and it might not even be working very effectively initially for you to be able to show it to anybody. But then uh, there are now detailed studies and uh, detailed trainings which help you set up minimal viable projects where you actually set up the face of the app. It might not work at all, and you know very well, but you then you walk the customer through the journey to help create that link. Does that help answer the question? So, how much does it cost to, uh, for the costing of an uh, MVP? Please? You should not invest too much money in it. That is uh, how much, generally how much. Is it? Depends on what you're making. So, for example, if I. So, for example, I read up. Um, so, there was a training that I attended where uh, one of the tech companies came up the first time that they came up with uh, the, the smart glasses where you actually can grab images. Mm -hmm. So, the MVP that was designed for that was a person uh, so projecting an image through your glasses, your spectacles. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do that where if you press a button here, uh, it is linked to a computer chip and that can actually project uh, figures on a screen, right? Mm -hmm. Logically speaking, if they were to come up with a model for that, they would have spent thousands of uh, dollars on it or thousands of pounds on it. Oh. What they effectively did was they made a person stand there, wear glasses, attached his glasses to a string right whenever that person will pull the string it would uh, basically trigger a button that would project on a screen using a regular projector it was literally that okay. so it could be that simple and this is what tech companies are doing <laughs> tech giants have uh, so these uh, agricultural products agricultural machines that are set up mm -hmm. you should if you research the internet uh, in the interest of time i can't go into a lot of examples but if you research them the basic products that they set up their design teams are only given one day to come up with a demo okay. so that means if you have to make it up with cardboard make it up with cardboard you want to make it up with a chair for all it cares you, for all they care you just have to come up with the concept a prototype, a prototype a basic prototype to give an experience that's about it that's mvp just to demonstrate right so if your idea is good enough it will come out of the mvp so i guess you have to judge the market as to determine how far between just literally i can look at it and it looks like it does a thing versus what how far do they how far do you need to go before it actually works the fully work thing i guess every market is slightly different yes as to how far you need to run down that path like that yes that's very well true um so the question is that um so if we could repeat while translating i came up with the answer but forgot the question to <laughs> tell them back to the audience here does every market have a different level say a nor to 100 percent that you need to achieve for an MVP. OK, so I'll translate the question first. Uh, so the question is that uh, for is every market different when it comes to uh, the level of maturity that the MVP needs to have uh, in order to be successful, right? Yes, uh, every market is different. Uh, for tech giants, 
because the investment and time is value for them. The resources that they have on board are charging thousands of dollars to come up with ideas. So they want to spend minimum time on it, right? And minimum time and effort to make it into a perfect product. But if you talk, talk about a startup, if I was to set up a company and I'm just selling goods that I'm making myself and I want to sell them through an app, there's so many way, uh, free app developing softwares available on the internet that maybe I can spend a little more time. Uh, it also comes down to who's selling the MVP. So if you have, if Cisco comes up with an MVP, even if it's made out of cardboard, you're more likely to pay attention to them than if I come up with an MVP and I've worked on it for one year. So not just a market, it's also the credibility that you have attained over the years that plays a factor. Uh, so it's a give and take. You have to look at the audience. You have to see. So if I have to go convince somebody in my family about a product idea because they've known me for a while, they know that I'll be able to take it to the end, they might get convinced much more sooner than if I was to come to you and convince you. So you keep it flexible and alter it based on the audience. For your initial circle, make something basic, stress test it, get feedback. And for the investors, maybe put in a little more effort there. Uh, I think this is kind of stuck. So customer profiling, you've made an MVP. Uh, the product is kind of up and running and you feel comfortable to go get it tested out. That plus you have to build it in your business plan as well. And you want to show whether there is a market out there for your product. So the first question that you're supposed to ask is who is your ideal customer? Who do you want to sell the product to? Saying that there's a need and my product is very attractive and you could go to any country and just sell it or any area and sell it is I think slightly naive and uh, will not attract the same kind of attention that you would want to get from an investor. Uh, a very good way of going about it and putting this in numbers. So for example, if a university has uh, 5,000 students and I just say, well, I think 10% of these students are going to try my product. Well, good for you, good for me, right? Where did I come up with the 10% from? Why would anybody believe my 10%? How do I make sense of that 10% to the investor. If I go down to variables and the whole customer profiling, it's not just going to make it uh, help me do a sanity check on the customer profile. It's also going to make it more believable for the people that I'm pitching it to. So for example, let's go back to the cooking Pakistani food for that matter. Uh, if I have 5,000 students in Oxford, I do their demographic profiling. I check where they're coming from. I check their age group, uh, educational background, the income. We all know that everybody mostly is on a student budget. And for a student budget, you can't expect them to be charging, paying for Michelin star restaurants every day, right? So there's a certain kind of money that you can expect to get from them. Uh, their occupation, uh, level of family formation. Uh, family formation makes sense for products that you would want to sell for a household. Uh, but if they're an individual product might not be relevant for your uh, business. Uh, psychographics uh, and generally goals and ambitions or desires of the certain audience that you're targeting. So if I do this, going back to the 5,000 student example, taking 10% for them might have been very vague. But today, if I say that out of the 5,000 students that have come to Oxford, 30% uh, have come from the subcontinent. It is safe to say that in the subcontinent, uh, there's a uh, so I'm just throwing ballpark figures. There's no reference to these numbers, just explaining them to you. So if I say that 30% of them are coming from the subcontinent, in the subcontinent, there's a easy 50% likelihood of people having the same taste palettes. So Indians and Pakistanis, and even Malaysians for that matter, are more uh, acquainted to the kind of food that is popular in that area. So if I say that out, out of the 5,000 people, 30% have come from the subcontinent, and out of those 30%, 20% uh, are students, and 20% are students, and then they have a certain budget, and this is my product type, I've created some context to the number 10%, which was a pie in the sky 10 minutes ago. I have a question uh, for from a startup perspective. 
when uh, when your product, for example, the Women's Summer of Sodas International, uh, this very quickly becomes very granular, very and very big because we have so many countries, like 113 yeah. countries. If we if we want to break this down on a local level for each country, that then like suddenly it becomes like a whole week or two weeks worth of effort just to come up with this when you have you know like how, how does how much time does one spend on the customer profiling if you are a small business but you have a global product okay the question is that how much time uh are we supposed to spend on customer profiling if you are a global business you want to go global but you're a small business you're a you're small startup exactly you're online so from your perspective there are two things that you can look at uh one you want to go global but you if there's you look at the resource constraint that you have in your business case right so for example if you have unlimited capacity you're able to for 1 million women in tech you even if 1 million women come on board today and your your systems are able to handle that then it's irrelevant for you who comes and who doesn't right customer profiling becomes critical when the resources are limited right if for example you were only able to get 5000 women online at a certain point in time and anything over and above would make your system crash that is when you want to ensure that you only get good quality customers and relevant customers onto your network and in order to ensure that you would have to do a customer profiling to only be targeting those because if you open this globally and everybody signs up and by the time the actual people who wanted to use this and make the most of the uh, and make you know get maximum value out of what you're giving them in terms of the content it would be too late right by the time they come in the system start crashing because it's in, on an overload so you then contain the pipe so either you have unlimited resources and you can take up anybody and everybody which i think in this world practically speaking is not possible there is always a constraint on one resource or the other and if i understand correctly from your perspective you will ensure good quality mentors the mentors are the, the resource constraint right and you will never overload them to ensure that the women are getting the best quality engagement that they want to get so you have a resource constraint and that's why you will funnel the customers okay so where is your ideal ideal customer uh, does he or she even exist and in the market that you want to target so be practical uh, just because you feel that the product is great you have to be sure that the person also the customer also think that it's great so the M mvp comes in again and stress test your product before ever introducing it to the market so market sizing how do you test it yes it is that simple you bring it to the customer you make them experience it uh, if it's not something that you can experience you uh, they can experience you brainstorm your idea uh, there's a joke that never brainstorm your idea with your mother because she's always going to say it's great and uh, so choose your customers wisely For example, he might tell you, yes, I would use it. I, I would use it because I find it uh, expensive. And then there might be something that he doesn't really make. I mean, yes. He won't really. He, maybe he just wants to get rid of your question, just, just wants yeah, to, yeah. you know, say yes and move on. Yeah. yeah I mean, Yes, good. So the question, and that's a very good question, that how do you make the MVP, uh, you stress as the MVP properly because there's a high likelihood that a customer or, or somebody that you're testing the product with will just at that point say that it's a great product. But in reality, when you actually go out and sell it, they will not be very keen on buying it, right? So there's a very interesting study around this, and this does happen, especially when you go to family and friends who explicitly say it's a perfect product, you come up with the best idea, and you are the one who should go and pitch it to the world, right? But when it comes to buying it, they're the first one either asking for discounts or freebies or stating we don't need it anymore. The world has moved on. Um, the best way to go about it in this situation is that, so there's, there's a proper 
science in research and customer dialogue. And that is where when you have a dialogue with the customer, instead of pitching your product first, you ask them about their problems. Like, for example, if you have a product and if I was to go sell food, I'd be like, do you have a lot of variety over here uh, when it comes to food? Where do you usually go for? So instead of starting off with what's wrong, you ask them what's going right for them. Right. And you're like, where do you go every day to get food? So if they specify a certain food truck, is it because of the proximity to the college? Is it because of uh, their uh, the price point? Is it because of the taste? They're going to tell you that. OK, so then you ask them if there's another option, would you take it? Why would you take it? So ask for their pain points and their problems as opposed to pitching your product first. And once you've listed those, and if you feel your product addresses them, that is when you stress test the product. So follow a process as opposed to just putting your product out. Because if, for example, they tell you that I would rather have soup than bread, and your product is bread, and then you introduce it and it still say it's great, then you're like, but you just said that you wanted soup. What makes you think that my product is great? So have a dialogue and have an open dialogue and take input as opposed to making a pitch because uh, when you're testing a product you're not selling it you're getting feedback so choose your questions wisely in that situation i have a resource for that i'm familiar with the four steps to be a picture maker yeah so they have very very detailed specific questions and interview types that you can do in order to avoid this would you buy this type of question because you don't get good answers? What I'm wondering is, is there some sort of famous book or good resource where uh, there are, like you said, these case studies where these variables are described? Because to somebody coming in, you might not know what variables even to think about. Um, do you have any good? Um, I could check and get back to you because you know, in in uh, in a company this size, they have their own research departments. So yeah. <laughs> I, I've been spoiled for choice. <laughs> so, but I'll I can always get back to you on that and let you know, and you can maybe share it with the audience. Okay. And is the market opportunity large enough with significant growth potential? Uh, address this head head on, right? If you just want to have 100 subscribers, like for example, you want one million women, and that's about it, you've established it today. No more, no less. That's your ambition. Right, but if you think that your product can only be sold to 100 people, stick to 100 people and say it up front. Don't come up with ambition which you will not be able to uh, stand by, or if the market doesn't even exist for it. So, for example, if I was to go sell a product in, I I want to sell 1,000 units of a product that I've made. I go to a country which has a population of 500. Even making that pitch doesn't make sense, right? But if I go to a country with a population of 5 million, then from an investor's, investor's perspective, I can easily get 5,000 to just try my product, right? There's a population of 5 million to begin with. But when you're talking about 5 million, you also need to talk about how you're even addressing those people. Because accessing and contacting 500 people is much easier than contacting 5 million people. So bridge these gaps and make sure that you do not let these loopholes uh, kick in when you're presenting. Then any barriers to entry? Uh, is there an ability for the competition to copy or replicate the product or service or innovator's uh, success? Assess this upfront. Nobody in this world makes a unique product these days, is some study that I read, where we like to believe that what we've come up with is unique, has never ever happened before, is the best idea in the world. It has happened before. It might have been successful or not successful. You could be doing it for the first time, but it must have been thought before at least. So do your research, and you should know your competitor better than you know yourself. Because that's the only way you can ensure that you are ready to face them and protect your market share uh, in the market that you want to go to. So how can the product be positioned for sustained growth? Uh, do you plan to be a market leader, or do you just want to undercut competition? If you are able to address that question to the investor, and this can be, and all of these variables that I'm telling you can be done in numbers. So, for example, as you said, what does an MVP cost? Whenever you do an MVP, you tell the investor that I spent maybe two pounds to test it, and this is the feedback that I got. You've put a number against it, you've made it believable, and you've made your quantified your effort. 
so same is the case with the market leader opportunity or you want to undercut the market so for example in your case if there's all the, if you're the first one doing it or nobody's opened free content i could question there are a lot of mooks in the market right there are a lot of online courses that are going on how do you compete with those and they have a brand name against them do you, are you competing with them or do you want to create your own niche and then your niche could be women only because they're open to all right so you establish yourself and you accept the fact that they also exist this competition maybe mit has a similar product on board right but maybe your agenda is different and the women that you're addressing is different so quantify that in the market sizing uh, numerical portion that i told you about and come to the figure more logically as opposed to more theoretically so for example uh, for uh, the 1 million women to tech mit might have come up with a mooc which is brilliant right and could teach people a lot but if you go to uh, a developing country you go to the rural areas not everybody will have access to laptops not everybody will have access to maybe a fixed line connection what they're using are mobile services so if 1 million women to tech comes up with an app which is more friendly for an app for a mobile takes less data and is does not require a lot of bandwidth maybe the likelihood of you penetrating that market will be slightly greater than the likelihood of a mooc penetrating which requires an access to a proper laptop because there's constant communication right so that's how you address such challenges that may exist um how nomadic is your business venture more of a plug and play or restricted to a predefined market only your question is it for everybody or is it just for one market so for example if you say it's 1 million women to tech you say i'm just going to go to the developing countries doesn't work there can you plug and play and just start working towards the development sector on or developed countries or not can you just start targeting europe only so if you're able to do it or not able to do it talk about it up front it just shows that you have a knowledge about what you're doing and that you've done your market research well address concerns on scalability up front and also show ability to adapt to changing dynamics if and when required uh this again just creates comfort uh if for example as i said if you're going to a market which already has a very low population of that population a very small percentage of people are going to use your uh, studies or your product then you say it up front and then you also talk about alternatives that what if it doesn't work there are you ready to move what will you do if the customers don't like your product because that no matter how uh, risk taking an investor is you will give him the comfort that if something is not going right you can pivot to another uh, direction altogether then product and service evaluation i think we've talked a lot about this already uh, but going to uh, this briefly over them again the minimal viable product work on that it saves times and resources and identify benefit to the customer and quantify them so for example if if i'm opening up a food cart what is the benefit to a customer of that food cart in terms of maybe saving money if the next food cart cart is 3 pounds a meal i'm selling it for 2 pounds a meal and that's what i show to the investor that because it's 1 pound less maybe there's a price elasticity that i can bank on right uh, other quantification methods are so for example now a lot of research agencies are coming what for the telecom sector we use this variable called the net promoter score it basically assesses uh how the person is going to recommend your product to the next customer so can you talk about that because i keep seeing that from other stores but you, you, you see it yeah. it's everywhere and i don't understand why it works apparently it's the magic thing uh, it's not just a telecom i see it everywhere I and that from other stores is the thing that that we say is the one predictor of success for a company but i don't see why i mean it's i don't know like from the user perspective it's usually just a pop up like 1 to 10 and it said how likely are you recommend our our service to a friend have you ever seen those pop up in your services i get it a lot yes so anyway and that's an echo like, like how does this most of the time ai hey, ignore it so i don't get feedback yeah. which is feedback <laughs> and then usually i'm like i'm not neutral like i don't think i How, yeah, how does that? Why does that work so well? Okay, so uh, the question is that how and why does the net promoter work? Uh, net promoter score work so well, and uh, why is it being used so extensively these days? So basically, whenever you communicate with a customer, you're looking at top of mind, and your recall. So if today somebody asked me which food 
track do you want to go to? Najar comes to mind. I just like Najar, right? And I've created this affiliation with it, not because of the way it was advertising its food cart, but because I like the food for whatever reason. So I would go for quality. Uh, in a perfect competition uh, situation where the products are very closely priced, which could be something like buying from either Tesco, Sainsbury, or M&S, what I've realized is that they're very closely priced. Some of the products will more will seem more M&S might seem more expensive, but they tend to match their prices with Sainsbury now and then, and actually state it very clearly as well. So, in certain situations where the customer is unable to differentiate between the offerings of different customers because the product has become so neutral right so for example if you have to buy bread it's just bread by the end of the day right if you walk into the store you don't want to spend too much time thinking about which bread to pick you might just pick up anybody any one of them so if the bread company wants to create a brand recall they want to make sure that you're the one uh, yet you pick their brand up the next time you walk into a store and you make a conscious effort around it you want to be residing in the customer's brain. And different strategies are used to make that happen. Subtle marketing, below the line marketing, above the line marketing, which could be TV commercials, uh, below the line marketing for the telecom sector is maybe sending you SMSs now and then. But for a, somebody like Tesco, I've realized they will subtly be advertising themselves now and then here and there, you know, sending you a flyer or, you know, giving some discounts or, uh, where have I seen subliminal marketing over here? Um, a good example relevant to this market. Anybody could think of something. Subliminal marketing. So very subtle marketing efforts that people do. So for example, when you watch movies, right? Uh, it's a complete commercial movie, but people tend to talk about airlines all of a sudden. I had the best experience on X airline in their business class. Why would an actor feel the need to explicitly talk about that product's name, right? But at the back of your mind, it's going to remain because you were in that moment and you remembered that dialogue. It's, you have that brand recall. So next time somebody asks you, and if the very next day somebody asks you which airline you want to travel on, there is a chance that you will just talk about that airline. Because an actor that you really liked from a movie that you really enjoyed talked about that product that he had a great experience. Now, nothing from that makes sense in the real world, but that's how the human brain works. So the net promoter score helps you create that recall. And once uh, an organization has made a lot of effort into reaching out to their customer through advertisements, through subliminal marketing, through one-to-one -one contact, they want to assess if their product is on the top of their mind or not. And if a product is on the top of their mind, that means their marketing budgets are being spent effectively. So that's why the NPS has become the new big thing, because now marketing dollars have become really important, especially with the digital marketing. So you know, you open an app and there's a small banner going. Most of them you ignore, but there are times the ones that you actually pay attention to. YouTube has started putting up a lot of ads in between whatever you stream. So I might not know of that product, but next time I go into store, it's going to have some kind of recall in my mind. So that's how NPS has been working these days. Uh, so then what are the pain points that the product or service will address? If you are able to identify those, the customer will be able to relate to your product more. And as I said, have that dialogue where you're talking about serving the customer as opposed to just making a pitch of what you think the customer wants. So there's a very fine line between that as well. Then interplay of the business ecosystem and market dynamics, uh, which we've discussed at great length. Uh, the target segment, whether it's a demand pull or a sales push, if you think your product is very unique in the market, um, will you be pushing it out to the customer? Or if there's high demand and you're just meeting unmet demand, that's slightly easier to do. But in that situation, the competition is that high at times mostly that you're unable to charge the premium for it. Uh, so sorry, in sales push, the competition is high enough where you are unable to charge a premium. But if there's a demand pull, that is where you can actually charge a premium for your product. So competition, needless to say, you should know your business, their business better than your own business because that's the only way you can survive in the market. Don't assume. Uh, they, people generally always focus on direct competition. Please focus on indirect competition more than anything else. Like for your case, MOOCs, right? Indirect competition. They're not there for the same reason, but they exist. they're existing, right? They're free content. Whoever you partner with today, 
will say, well, they're also doing it. So keep an eye for indirect competition as well. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's discuss that as well. So yes, Coursera is a very good example. And a lot of companies are now partnering with Coursera to open uh, training modules for their. So Telenor recently has partnered with Coursera. And we have a huge access to so many training modules that we can just do free of cost. Linda, yeah, Linda exactly. Linda, Coursera, all these platforms open opportunities to people. So pricing and promotion. So does the price per unit cover for all the fixed and variable operating costs is placed? Um, unfortunately, for a lot of startups, I've realized they do not have a good grip on the cost that they might incur uh, long run and the short run. And some of the variable costs that they miss out include, so you, you make a product, you know this is what it took to actually make that product. What you did not account for is the area that you were sitting in to make that product. Somebody is paying a rent for it. When your product scales up, that rent should also have been accounted for in the cost per unit. So please ensure that the fixed and the variable costs are accounted for. And you give the investor the comfort that you've actually done a deep dive on the cost as well. And no further surprises are going to come in the future. Might not be very easy to do for a new startup. But as far as basics are concerned, I think it's not that big a rocket science to figure out what, where you're sitting, what it's taking to use resources to come up with that product, and what channels would you use to take that product to the customer. Is the market price sensitive or receptive to premium pricing? As I said, comes down to the kind of audience that you're targeting, whether it's a demand pull product or a supply push, a sales push. So you might right now feel that there's a sales push, but eventually you realize that as more people get, aware, get awareness to what you're giving, it might just become a demand pull. So, the transition could happen during the life cycle of your business, but be wary of that so that you're making you're able to make pricing decisions accordingly. Carry out market assessment for customer affordability. Do benchmarking. Uh, double check whether it makes sense or not to even buy your product or not, and whether there are alternatives already available. So if a MOOC is free, why should I pay for you? You know, you have to be giving that something extra from, to justify charging money, right? So simple, simple things. But if you're giving one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one experience, you have mentors, you have a restricted community, you're giving immediate feedback, a correspondence with might not be available for MOOCs, why not charge a premium for it? You know, so it's the value that you're giving to the customer to justify the time and effort that you're putting in to bring the product to life. I mean, if I guess, yeah, so that the, uh, the there is there is content that is already there most of the time people aren't consuming it but they are really demanding or willing to pay for it so pay for interaction interaction i would like to believe that it's more interaction because there's a lot, free, a lot of free content available, but there's much less human interaction now that so much freebies are there, right? So that human touch uh, between investor and a business startup, between a business startup and a customer, I think we're just missing that point. Bring that back to the whole equation, and I think we will all do well. Uh, what is the go-to-market strategy? Um, are you trying with the minimum viable product? Are you going to then implement uh, go all out on day one? Are you going to start small and then expand? So have a clear focus on that. And when you talk about a go-to-market strategy, talk about the channels that you want to focus on, talk about the cost per channel, and whether the outreach justifies the cost per channel or not. So a very classic example of this is Facebook marketing. So while Facebook lets you, lets you do uh, geo-marketing as well, uh, so it would let you just advertise stuff for people in Oxford. But is that entire audience relevant to you or not? So what we've realized in digital marketing is that when you pay for mass advertising, you somehow miss out on the niche that you were targeting in the first place. So choose your uh, avenues effectively. For somebody like um, you choosing 1 million women to tech on a global front, 
going all out makes perfect sense. But somebody with limited resources wanting to get good quality customers and revenue paying customers, maybe targeting them in a more personal way makes more sense as opposed to just putting out an ad word, which is more public in nature. Uh, evaluate all potential sales and marketing channels for detailed cost benefit analysis. So cost versus outreach. Look at that. How many people you need? What quality of customer you need? Just don't go for a medium because it's popular. No, Facebook Facebook is easy, but use their uh, uh, analytical capabilities, which include your marketing. Do some more research. Don't spend your precious dollars on just uh, advertising to areas which are not relevant uh, for your product. Uh, business operations generally, um, so I've uh, talked in detail about the different costs that are going to come into play. So when you are pitching to the investor, make sure that you differentiate between the, toss, uh, the cost elements and overall business plan elements. You talk about the direct cost, which include the customer acquisition costs, what it takes to bring the one customer on board, which could be if you're selling. Uh, so for example, in a telecom case, uh, subscriber acquisition cost is the cost of selling the SIM. Right. So um, we have to pay taxes on it, but we can't charge the same amount to the customer. So for us, that's a subscriber acquisition cost. Uh, if you are paying a cost to actually bring a customer on board, what is the payback? Because unless the SAC gets paid back, you are not going to start making money. Right. Uh, then direct production cost for the unit. You need to be returning those as well uh, from the revenue that you're urging, earning. Uh, gross margins, as far as operating costs are concerned, make sure that you cover the marketing costs, sales channel and commission costs, indirect production costs, for example, any product that you're making. Um, so for example, if I am making, um, if I'm making podcasts, I could, and, and I'm calling people and experts over who are charging me by the hour, right? So every one hour podcast could cost me $100. But if for a monthly basis, I'm also buying a high quality internet connection, which could be a thousand dollars a month, I need to allocate that cost to every single podcast that I make. Do not forget that thousand dollars. So that's an indirect cost of production because it's coming to lump sum. So it is for the entire month needs to just be distributed since it cannot be associated to a single product. So every cost that can be allocated to or uh, to a single product is a direct cost and anything that is taken as a larger sum needs to be allocated to individual individual products and is not pertaining to a single unit that will be an indirect cost human human resources human resources needed to say uh, have a cost of their own there's administrative costs which includes rentals and energy uh, electricity uh, energy bills whatever you're paying out and then the management fee, which could include any consultants you got on board, um, any uh, organizations that you interacted with uh, to help you set up the business plan, which I believe is not necessarily required. You can do it yourself, but some people do feel the need that they need to formally go to an organization for legal opinions, for accounting opinions, et cetera. That's where the management fee needs to be accounted for. So uh, to conclude the business Excel model part, I think as far as financial returns are concerned, uh, identify key milestones. Uh, these key milestones could be, I want my product to be very successful. For an investor, this is not a key milestone. With all due respect, everybody wants their product to be successful. It's how other people define success, right? So between you and your investor, you can agree that customer uptake could be a one of the variables, right? So for example, you could say that the day I touch 5,000 is my initial milestone, which you've already done. So bravo, right? Even more, I guess, right? I think we're almost at 9,800 this morning. Congratulations, that's just happened, I think, in days. <laughs> sure, the hard work pays clearly. <laughs> so, uh, so customer uptake could be one of the milestones. Uh, top line growth could be a milestone. So. Look at what the investor is interested in. So for example, if the investor that you're going to is feels very emotionally connected to reaching out to underdeveloped countries and rural areas, and for that person, an individual is much more important than the money he's going to make, then make a commitment on the number of people that you're going to touch. So adjust your milestone to the audience that you're interacting with. Commit on the top line growth, you could do that. Uh, break even, 
you could say that you know given the product that i have right now the product testing that i've done i am looking at a break even of say one year two years be realistic in the short run and that i'll come back to again uh, general return on investment uh, i'm i am assuming that most of the audience over here is all, already aware of the internal rate of return uh, the profitability margins and everything so i'm not going into too much detail but talk about your return kpis over here unit economics if you have a very simple product if you're not setting up an industry from day one um, talk about units it's just perfectly fine if i'm making a dish and i'm making lasagna i make a whole lot of lasagna but i can serve eight people with it i divide the cost by eight and i say per plate it's costing me that much just gives the investor the comfort that i am going down to the customer level and plus it becomes easier for me to do the math going forward as well because when i source the ingredients for making two lasagnas the cost goes down because i'm now i'm buying in bulk so it gives me a feeling of how much of that value can i retain internally and how much of it do i want to pass on to the customer so for example if making one dish of lasagna cost me 10 pounds but if i make two dishes and i go buy from a bigger store because i'm able to get the ingredients in bulk and they will not go waste and the cost per dish goes down to 5 pounds so now in 10 pounds i'm making two dishes my profit has doubled overnight do i want to reduce the price to the customer or would i like to keep the profits to myself is something that you decide and pitch to the investor accordingly and if you if you pass the value to the customer you're becoming a more competitive product with the potential to uh, upscale immediately or if you don't want to upscale if you think your resources will not be able to scale up uh, you won't be able to scale up your resources as fast as you would like to then you just retain the profits and show an even higher profitability ratio internally uh, earning before interest tax and depreciation this is commonly used but uh, i would also request that do not ignore taxes and depreciation the reason i say that is depreciation from an accounting perspective might be very theoretical where uh, this building could be depreciated in 10 years but it doesn't mean that it's going to fall down in the 11th right it's still going to be in place so for a small startup i won't even depreciate it for 10 years i might depreciate it for 20 years but i need to be practical when i do it like if i know that this computer is going to go out of uh, memory in 3 years or i would need to upgrade because it's just going to slow down and all the uh, peripherals are going to be much faster then please depreciate it because for your business to keep running you need a good machine to be doing running your numbers on right so put that as part of your cost when you're talking about free cash flow and set money aside for it uh then once you've accounted for taxes and any depreciations there's net income and then the free cash flow very simplistic formula for free cash flow is you reduce ebitda and deduct the capital expenditure that you're doing and then you have free cash flow what it does not account for is any interest payments on the debt that you have taken which might be due in the near future or any depreciations if you account for them today it's good for your business to not reinvest the cash elsewhere without setting some aside uh, for maybe a new laptop so manage your cash uh, what i've seen and noticed in startups which become so unfortunate as and i've seen a lot of those happening they they're doing really well the product is doing wonders they need to expand but they run out of cash to do that they tie up cash in either uh, debtors you know people are either they owe money or somebody owes them money and they run out of hard cash as a small startup please make sure that you have the paper currency in currency in your hand or in your bank you just need that money don't tie for and you know whenever people help us start up um, set up business cases they are being done by very uh, mature organizations and they find it very comfortable to tell you take a loan or um, let uh, the suppliers owe you money for a couple of months it's fine it is not fine for small businesses those are things that work for you when you reach a certain scale so try and not run out of cash keep some aside for a rainy day and do not loan out or keep the transaction on a daily basis as much as you can stay away from credit cards is one of the things that i tell especially women who start up with very limited funds from their houses and you know they just want to keep continue running a very small niche business uh credit cards are to be steer clear of 
Okay, so that was on the business plan itself. Now some key pointers that uh, should come handy to you and they do come handy to me even to date. Never cherry pick numbers. Uh, pick trends, contextualize them and make them believable. Cherry picking numbers is that today I say, you know what, I will have uh, penetrated 80% of the consumer market in Seychelles, right? That country has hardly a population of 100,000 people. Even if I pop if I've penetrated my product by 80%, it's 80,000. It is nothing in the larger scheme of events. If you throw such numbers, the investors don't think that they're dumb. They would know what an island is worth and what a larger country is worth. So don't cherry pick numbers which you feel are big, but actually show some reference, show some context. Maybe you could communicate it in a way that if I've tested it in a small island with 100,000 people and I could penetrate up to 80%. I think it's safe to say that with a similar customer profile, maybe in a larger country, I can go up to 10%. Create some reference, be realistic to yourself and to the audience. Where do you want your business to end up in five to 10 years? Um, this is a classic issue that new startups are now running into these days after uh, listening to the likes of big startups who spin off for millions of dollars and they do it in one or two years uh, based on the book value of their company and their assets and investors are now becoming wary of this because they want long-term returns they will they don't want to be investing in a company that does not have long-term plans that is only looking short term and there's a man or a woman who's just investing or taking money for an investment to spin out of it themselves after a year and hand over the business to a person that invested doesn't know anything about at this point in time. So if you show a slightly longer term um, involvement or a longer term affiliation or projection for your business, it will just going to, it's just going to create more trust around your uh, concept. So always have an end game in mind and talk about it. Sometimes they invest uh, with say a certain amount of money in three or five or ten years time, and then uh, get a get a good exit. Uh, Fair. Most of the venture capital are cyclical, or yeah. is it my? I, I, I might be wrong. No, no, you're perfectly correct. So the question is that uh, some of the investors themselves want a good exit in two to three years. Uh, it's a very valid point. It differs from uh, industry to industry. In the tech industry, that is definitely a case where investment investors also want a good exit. Exit. Now look at it from so you really nail it. So if you talk about uh, from an investor's perspective, while so if an investor wants to bail out or exit with a good return in three years, you have to be running for the fourth year for them to leave in the third, right? If you choose to leave in the second, they can't leave in the third. You get my point? So somebody needs to meet halfway. One of you needs to be talking about the long run. And for you to get the money from the investor, if you're not talking about the long run, he will not know when to exit. You get the human psychology here? So play it out. Um, and, uh, and I'm not saying that we be untrue to the process. We should see a business as an opportunity for at least five to 10 years. And when either of the sides, be it the investor or the entrepreneur, decide to move out, they should be able to move out from an up and running business. So the exit strategy means highest returns. But if either or one of them looks at the business from a short term perspective, they will not be giving it their 100%. The entrepreneur will be looking very short term, will not be investing enough for a sustainable business, and the investor will not be giving enough money to sustain the business on the long run as well. So I think this is one of the areas which needs to be managed when you develop a business case. That's Set realistic short-term targets and please ambitious long-term targets. Let's be very practical here. We tend to be ambitious short run uh, and then you become, and then we're unable to deliver. So I would suggest that your short-term goals should be as realistic as possible. It could be a six month goal, a one year goal, and then you, put in ambitious uh, numbers moving forward because then they're going to make the ambition number, ambitious numbers seem so more believable. 
if you're able to show results in one to two, three uh, months, right? Because venture capitalists tend to be tracking your business very regularly as well when it comes to the initial figures. Speak the audience's language. Do not assume that they know your business or they know your market. Uh, do some hand holding. We, especially in the tech sector, we tend to assume that people know everything, right? So if I come from the telecom sector or the technology sector, when I was making this presentation, it took me a good two to three hours to not use the jargon that I use on a daily basis, right? To actually talk and communicate in words which are more relatable to you than me using words like oh, ARPU. You won't know what an ARPU is, right? It's as average revenue per user, not a big deal. But if I keep using it repeatedly, I'm just going to lose the audience in no time. So speak their language. Use visual aid. I cannot stress this more. And the reason I say this is because people remember 10% of what they hear, 20% of what they read, and 80% of what they see. And that's a fact. This is this can be an entire lecture for another day on um, effectively using graphs and not just simple graphs. Uh, how many of you have used ThinkCell before? ThinkCell. Trust me, it's a miracle. And it's one of the things that you should use when making graphs. It just makes life easy. Think cell, T H I N C K C E double L. Think, simple yeah. think, yeah. cell, C E double L. Uh, e double L. Most think cell, it's basically a, a software. Is it's basically a software. It helps you make graphs and uh, financial. Um, it, it helps you do graphical representation of your financials. Uh, a lot of consultants use it regularly. Actually, almost all the consultants that I work with were using it. And that's how they make their presentations look super fancy. Uh, if you want, we could have a session on that someday. Very basic, short course. And I think that will help you a lot. Uh, it's, it makes your presentations look professional. It does half the work for you, all the growth rates, all the trajectories and everything, like waterfalls, does it in seconds. So definitely worth using and it's just easier on the eyes as well an excel dump versus a graph i i wanted to put some here but then it would have become a never ending session uh, so yeah when i talk about visual aid she's risking her life i could be very dramatic about this she's risking her life i will tell you i will talk about a woman who's risking her life good good for everybody right so basically, you are saying that the video advertisement or uh, carousel advertisement is better than the classical advertisement. Yes, at times, especially for certain products, because you want to see it, right? Yeah. Uh, if you notice uh, all these, and that's happened recently only. Um, historically, you would get class ads in newspapers, but now every basic customer product is also coming up with pictures, yeah. right? Something very basic like. Uh, rice would come in pictures why because you know they're making commitments on that product packaging yeah. so visualization recognition when you walk into the store you want to remember what you saw and then also from a recollection perspective if i had just said this she's risking her life there's no context right i do this the red is going to stay in your mind i I wish I had studied psychology, but I've seen this happen and I don't know why, but it happens, right? And then I don't need to say anything. Yeah. As, a, as an individual, I don't know about you people, but when I see this, I'm like, why is she doing this? You know, why would you sit there? And without me having to even say it, you'd be like, she could just fall and something on the same line as to she's risking her life comes to your mind. So that's how visual aid plays. But when you use visual aid, please be careful that you do not want to distract the audience only uh, as well. So if I had put this picture up where she was first jumping on the rock and then sitting and then jumping and then sitting, you would have just stopped listening to me and you would have started focusing there and you would have just lost track of what I was saying. So I only wanted you to focus on the fact that she was risking her life, not that she's a uh, she's an acro uh, she does acrobats or uh, she likes to jump around. That's not relevant 
for this current message that I wanted to give you. Use voiceover effectively. Uh, the reason I say this, I've, I've noticed people put in really great visual graphics, and then they're staring at the screen all the time and presenting like this. And the audience is like, if I had to read from there, what are you doing here? So the visual aid is a cue for you, but only a cue. It is meant for the audience. If, if, if in a voiceover I had to tell you all this and I had just written everything that I've said on the slide, either you would be reading the slide or looking at me, you can't do both at the same time. So that's why we declutter sides as well when it comes to text, right? Every page, every slide, every chart that you present should have a key takeaway. It is completely senseless, baseless to put anything on a slide that does not have a takeaway. Um, I run through this every single day, even to date, people who've had years of experience in their roles just somehow struggle to understand this. Only recently, um, so it's a work example, so I'll fudge it up a bit. Uh, one of the departments came up with this offer and they're like, you know, if, um, if we have more sales channels, we'll be able to get better quality customers. Simple concept, more sales channels, better quality customers. And in a graph, in a slide, they're showing the sale channels going up. So there's a graph which shows that today we have 10 sales channels. Tomorrow, we'll have 50. So from your perspective, if I'm saying that a sales channel is going to improve the quality of the customer, and all I'm showing on the graph is the sales channel going, number of sales channels going up, what's the key takeaway? What do I get out of it? What's the correlation? Makes absolutely no sense. So if there were two graphs presented, one word that for every person, every new sales channel I added, I was able to get two more customer from this high income area. If I had established that and then put up a sales channel, then the correlation was that since this has happened, if I increase is, you can, the key takeaway is that I'll be able to improve the customer quality. So if on a slide you put up something that just shows a strength without an ending point, delete it, not required. Because as I said earlier, research states that uh, in good pitches, venture capitalists especially only spend three and a half minutes on a pitch. You have, you are really struggling for time in that case. Unfold the story one element at a time uh, and learn the art of storytelling. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, in so many ways that nobody tells you this till you become part of the senior management in an organization. And I think this is something that we should have been taught in school. Because the art of storytelling is changes the ball game altogether. It's how you talk to the our audience. It's how you engage them. It's how you bring them back into the room. And nobody does it better than Pixar. I don't know if you people have heard about this, the secret storytelling formula that they have. Please search it. And it is the most interesting thing ever. And you'll be surprised to know that senior executives actually go to art schools to read this and to understand how to go about it. I recently went through um, a training myself, and it was an eye opener. Where the art of storytelling is not, it's not just about what I'm telling you, it's also about how I'm telling you. Today, I'm just sitting here, not making much of an effort on that front because I'm not pitching a business plan to you. But my body language, my tone of voice, what I told you before, how I created some, um, what do you call it, uh, suspense in the middle and how I ended it will make or break your business case. So uh, there's, uh, I think, um, a lot of information is available on this online. How it becomes relevant to your business case can also be done at some point in time. Uh, just like the visual aid, it can do with a full session on itself. And it is very critical for people to learn this. So Google this up, and I think this should be good fun. And Finding Nemo is one of the very uh, popular examples that are given during trainings. It's almost all about the numbers. And then now you're saying storytelling is important. So what's the, what's the balance between those two? Very good question. So the question is that, uh, so I was talking about numbers historically. I kept saying that it was all about the numbers, and now I'm saying it's all about the story as well. 
so the numbers will tell a story and that's also you use visual aid that has numbers that will help you follow through a story so for example when you talk about numbers maybe um i could actually i could not draw yeah. i could but then we will lose connection yeah so maybe we can have a discussion after uh, the session ends and i can explain how it's done uh, and that is when i said use think cell look that up um if we have a follow up session ever or you could just touch base with me later as well i can show you how think cell and storytelling start hand to hand the end thank you very much i i hope that was helpful Post any questions. Sure. I'm not sure if they have, but uh, you need start. the headphones. Yes, thank you. Okay, if you're watching live, this is your chance. I hope you have asked questions on the chat, but if not, please do, and we'll try to ask it as well. Please continue the discussion. Okay, we have the viewers. Hello. So basically, um, your question as to how can we tell the story? This is a typical exercise. I put in my revenue, I put in my gross margin, my cost, OPEX, and everything, right? Numbers, 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 one year, two year, three year, four year. And I'm sure when you put such a table on, in, on a PowerPoint, it's nothing but a table, and especially for a person who's presenting it, you're just looking back to it, and you see very tiny numbers, two, six, four, eight, seven, something, and then you're trying to figure out what you want to refer to. And the second you lose the eye contact with the audience, you've lost them, and you've lost yourself in the right? So um, softwares like Excel, what they help you do is, so when this table versus a couple of ways of presenting it. One of them is, I, I could just say, that I project my revenue to be going like this. One of the ways of saying it, I could say that I project my cost to be going like this. And I could also say that I plan on maintaining a flat OPEX and my EBITDA from negative will go to positive in X number of years. That's one way of telling the story. Now, these are all numbers that I put in, but when I do a voiceover, I say that because of the customer and the customer with certain social economic class, I'm able to address them and come up with the revenue like that. But now when I'm talking about revenue and I've also talked about customers' social economic class, there's very easy way for me to define the social economic structure as well. I could complement the revenue graph with maybe a pie chart for the country or the people that I'm addressing, I can say that X percent of these individuals have come from socioeconomic class A, I income earners. So this is the audience that I want to attract because my product is very expensive, right? So I put numbers around SEC. Now this is a fact on the ground and nobody can challenge this. So if uh, an economic survey has actually put this up, there is nobody no investor can tell me that what I'm saying is incorrect. Okay? Because so uh, socioeconomic class. So socioeconomic segmentation that's done for different audiences, um, different strata of the society. And these figures, and the more you validate your projections with publicly available information, it just creates relevance and the nobody is able to challenge you anymore. So put in facts and figures. Like for example, for our sector, we tend to use um, GSMA a lot. So GSMA is a it's a global mobile congress that uh, so basically it's a global organization like BMI who collect global statistics uh, and uh, they have done massive research. They work in collaboration with different governments like the IMF, and when they come up with any report, nobody challenges them. Right? So when you refer you're working back to such levels, uh, what do you call it? As white. Sorry? As white. Exactly, exactly. So I could put SECK. I could also put um, age pyramids. 
Mm. It could be like this for one country, it could be the other way, where some economies have a much larger older population, some economies have a much larger younger youth population. So if your product is more relevant for the younger audience, and then you tell them that see in UK there's a much greater older population, but that is why I'm going to uh, Pakistan for that matter, where the younger population is much greater. So the percentage of audience that I can target goes up. They can't question you on the penetration anymore. You put a fact on the table that nobody can challenge. And when you build your forecast up based on variables that are publicly available, the believability in your forecast goes up multiple fold. So you challenge, you basically address questions before they're even thrown out at you. And the art of storytelling comes in in the sense that had I said, I'm going to earn revenue. I'm going to earn revenue from a group of customers who are coming from a certain socioeconomic class. And then I talk about the product that I'm going to sell them. Why will they be interested in my product? And because they'll be interested from, in my product for this, this reason, and I'm able, if I'm able to use these X, Y, Z sales channels to get to them, this revenue becomes plausible. Sarah, um, we posted, but no, uh, you've, we've got six thumbs ups and 19 followers, but nobody's posted a question. So I made a comment that whoever has question in the future, whether it's yourselves or somebody that you want to share this content with can post and we can answer later on. I think I will wrap up here. Thanking you. And, um, so thank you for watching and dialing this We'll wrap up the fundamentals of business planning by Sarah Shahid. Can we give a round of applause, please? <laughs> round of applause. Okay, see you next time. Thank you. We'll talk about this right afterwards. One second.